بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد uh, Inshallah today we'll conclude the consequences of sins and enter into the next part of the book So Ibn Qayyim Rahmatullah says the 50th consequence ومن عقوباتها أنها مدد من الإنسان يمد به عدوه علي وجيش يقويه به على حربه وذلك أن الله عز وجل ابتلى هذا الإنسان بعدو لا, يف... لا يفارقه طرفة عين وصاحب لا ينام عنه um, So here Ibn Qayyim رحمة الله عليه saying that uh, sins empower the shaytan Sins empower the shaytan So when we eat that food is sustenance that provides our body with energy, with strength and the more nutritious a person's diet is, the more energy it gives the body. And the healthier the body will be, the more capable the body would be, not just in the here and now, but long term. And as <clears throat> uh, someone told me, who's in the medical field, what you eat in your 20s, you'll find the effects of that in your 30s. What you eat in your 30s, you'll find the effects of that in your 40s, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we have this concept that what we uh, intake from food and sustenance and water and even the quality of the air around us affects the body. The healthier it is, the better. The more tainted, toxic, unhealthy it is, the worse. Right? Um, and similarly, you have something going on with the heart and the spiritual and spirituality. Ibadah, worship, uh, along with sincerity. So worshiping Allah, the way He told us to worship Him, and doing that sincerely provides healthy sustenance for the soul. And that healthy sustenance uh, creates a type of fortification that prevents the shaitan from uh, influencing the self. The healthier the soul is, the less influential, the less capable the shaitan is against the soul. And the opposite holds true. The more we taint the soul, the more we corrupt it through our actions or what we call sins, the stronger it, the, the stronger it lets, the, the stronger the shaitan becomes, the more capable he becomes against us, against the soul. So if eating junk food harms the body, by providing the body or putting in the body things that the body cannot uh, digest, it cannot break down. You know, they say that corn syrup, right, is so unhealthy for the body that literally the body doesn't know what to do with it. When it enters the body, the body doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know what to do with it. And so it automatically stores it as fat, right? It doesn't know how to break it down. I think it's corn syrup. But when you look at a lot of products, one of the primary ingredients is corn syrup, right? Um, so similarly, when we do sins, it's as though we are enriching the shaitan and empowering him against us. Right? So this is something that's you know pretty pretty serious, and the shaitan never leaves us, never leaves. I heard a beautiful analogy the other day. A guy was walking outside during daytime, and he has his phone. And he's teaching us, like, you see my shadow? Look at how it moves as I move. If I walk forward, it walks with me. If I walk backwards, it walks with me. If I turn, it turns with me. If I raise my hand, it, it raises its hand with me. Everything that I do, my shadow is mimicking 100%. And he says that similarly, the angels follow us the way our shadow follows us. Everything we do, the angels write it down. Always with us, just like our shadow. And similarly, our shayateen, the devils that try and deceive us, are trying day in, day out. Day in, day out. That's literally their purpose. Now, not all jinn are shayateen. There are from among the jinn, those who are Muslims, those who are just going about living their lives like human beings, go about living their lives. But there are some shayateen who are of the army of Iblis, who are employed by Iblis to deceive us. And so they are trying day in, day out, from the moment we wake up till we sleep. 
every day, every night. Like our shadow is with us, the shaitan is with us. And so, as we spoke about before, one of the consequences, Ibn Qayyim Rahmatullah mentions that one of the consequences of sins is that it distances, it distance, it distances the angels from us. And the more distant the angels become from us, the closer the shayateen are able to get to us. And the opposite holds true. When the angels are closer to us, it's as though they prevent the shayateen from uh, harming us. Right? Uh, and so this is a pretty similar point right here, number 50. Uh, but it's giving us a different perspective, a different angle to understand this. Uh, and so... <clears throat> The shayateen are always following us with the sole purpose of dragging us to hellfire, making us fail. Uh, and so it's a constant grind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, advising us to be patient with, to do certain things to make sure that the enemy doesn't win. Now this seems pretty exhausting, it seems pretty bleak. And I get this question from you know the younger ones when they sit there, Man, this, is, this is our religion, this seems like it's too much. But I will tell them the following, look, this idea of this constant grind and I have to keep working because if I'm not working hard, the enemy is working against me, is something that we practice in, in our day-to-day -day lives. It, it's nothing you know, different. So for example, if anyone who's in business, in the business field, they own businesses and they run businesses and whatnot, to them, it's a 24-7 grind. Mm -hmm. You are managing your business 24-7, period. Anything, anytime the business needs something, it doesn't matter what time of the day it is. You have, to, you have to do it. And any business is competing against other businesses. And those other businesses would like to put you out of business. And so you see how these business men and women are working? See how their mentality is? But we accept it. Why? Because, well, if you are able to succeed there, you can make a lot of money. If you make a lot of money, that's pretty satisfying. That's gratifying. It's worth it. Well, similarly, we have this enemy. He's trying to kick our butt. And he's trying to get us to hellfire. He's trying to put us out of business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is telling us, you know, he's there day in, day out. So you got to work day in, day out. And there are these simple things that you need to do. And if you succeed, ta'ala, what do you get? You get paradise. Very similar concept. Right? If you're not studying now, What's going to happen when test time comes? You're going to have to crunch all the information. And when you crunch the information, the, the mind cannot retain it. And then, you know, you're not in for a good time with your test. But if you work and you organize your day, you organize your uh, school uh, responsibilities, and you study over a period of time, when test day comes, you'll be relaxed. You'll be fine. All you have to do is review a little bit. And, you know, that's it. You'll be just fine. So we have this idea, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us throughout the Qur'an. Iblis, the shayateen, are your enemy, so take them as an enemy. And when we say enemy, right, we're talking about a certain frame of mind, a mindset. This is my enemy, meaning he is trying to harm me. He's not just someone who doesn't like me. You know, there are a lot of people out there who don't, who don't like Islam, but you know, they have the freedom to worship. They're, they're still human, okay? They have uh, equal rights in, in front of the court of law. I disagree with Islam. I don't like Islam. I think Islam this, is this and that, right? But they're not actively trying to harm us. We say we differ with these people, but there's no need to see them as enemies. However, those who not only don't like Islam, they are actively trying to harm Muslims is an, en an enemy. How do we deal with that? Well, we have to stand in front of them and push back one way or another, whatever way we can. We have to push back. We have to take this person as an enemy by doing what is necessary to stop their plans and to counter their plans. Right? That's how we take someone or something as an enemy. Well, Allah is telling us to do this with Iblis and the Shayateen. Take them as an enemy. They're trying to harm you, so you counter that by protecting yourself. And not only that, do the things that harm them. Do the things that bring them misery, that counter their plans. As uh, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, that Iblis says, I, I ruined humans with sins. 
I ruin them with sins. I go to them and I make them do sins. I encourage them to do sins and I sin, sin, sins. And then Iblis says, and they ruined me with istighfar. Mm-hmm. With istighfar. They just say, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Allah forgives them my entire plot, my ta- all my efforts, as though they're nothing. I mean, can you imagine that? Spending years upon years upon years to try and get someone to hellfire. And then one day they say, you know what? I've been living wrong. Oh Allah, please forgive me. And then all of that is gone. Okay? It destroys him. So, um, the 50th consequence is this idea where I am, I, I am introducing things to my body. I am providing things to my body through my acts of worship that affect primarily my spirituality. When we do salah, yes, there are health benefits to salah. There are mental, there are psychological benefits to salah. And alhamdulillah. But the primary purpose of salah is what? The soul. Same thing with fasting. Fasting has much, has many health benefits, psychological benefits. But the primary purpose of fasting is, has to do with the soul. Same thing with zakah. There are many economic, uh, economical benefits. There are, uh, there are psychological benefits. There are, well, I guess no uh, physical benefits, but the primary benefit is the soul. So the more we provide our soul with a healthy diet, the, the less capable the shaitan is against us. The more unhealthy our spiritual diet is, the stronger the shaitan is against us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ أَنفُسِكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَيُدْخِلْكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ وَمَسَاكِنَ طَيِّبَةً فِي جَنَّاتِ عَدْنٍ ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ وَأُخْرَى تُحِبُّونَهَا نَصْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَفَتْحٌ قَرِيبٌ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Here these verses are towards the end of Surah Al-Saf in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, shall I not inform you of a, uh, a trade, a business contract, that will save you from a painful punishment. So this kind of ties into my analogy with business, right? Uh, which I didn't, this is kind of, this, is, this just came up. Uh, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hey, let's, let's enter into a contract with one another and provides it or frames it through a business contract. Why? Because we love business. We love business. You know, if we Muslims, especially Arabs and Daisies, weren't so busy talking about politics, we'd probably be talking about business, right? Um, this is very normal. So we like this kind of language. It's interesting. And the reward or the benefit of this contract is that it, it saves us from a painful punishment, meaning hellfire. Okay, what are the terms and stipulations of this contract? Well, what's upon us? Our responsibility is to believe in Allah and His Messenger and to strive in the way of Allah with our wealth and with ourselves. So at the basic level, striving with our wealth means zakah, and the basic level of striving with our bodies is salah and fasting. And then you add hajj to that. So the obligations. Above that, you get into the sadaqat, you get into the extra nawafil salahs, you get into the uh, da'wah field, you get into the areas that benefit Muslims. And then Allah says, this is better for us if only we knew. Um, and so that's our, uh, our terms. That's our responsibilities. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, his a uh, part of the contract, his responsibilities. If we do that, Allah will forgive us of our sins and he will allow us uh, admissions into paradise in which rivers flow under and uh, homes that are blessed and beautiful in a permanent paradise. That is truly the great victory and other things that we love. Other things that we love. And Ibn Qayyim is uh, quoting these verses uh, specifically because of this last verse. That's the connection between these verses and this, this consequence. And other things that we love. Allah will give us other things that we love, among which is Nasrun min Allah wa Fathun Qareeb. Victory from Allah and opening doors that weren't open before. So in the time of the Prophet والسلام, opening Mecca, um, <coughs> opening Arabia in general, and then during the time of the Sahaba, opening you know, the, the Levant opening uh, Iraq and into Persia 
and then opening northern, northern Africa and, into Andalusia, and then Yemen and all this area. Allah opened these doors for, the, for Muslims. Uh, this, this, these are things we love. I mean, any, if we were to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something so unique in our times today, it'd probably be, be something around the, along the lines of, you know, may Allah give Muslims victory in, in India, or may he remove this administration. Or may Allah remove the uh, Zionist rule in, in Palestine or something along these lines. This is a major thing. This is something we would love to see uh, in our lifetime. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying when we do Iman, when we live by Iman and we do Jihad, uh, this, these are the results. وَبَشِّرِ uh, الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Give glad tidings to the believers. Now, of course, all of this and the sustenance of the soul revolves around taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've gone over the word before in every, uh, in every uh, khutbah, we begin by reminding ourselves, reminding one another to live by taqwa. And so taqwa is the primary sustenance of the soul. The more taqwa a person has, the stronger, the healthier their soul is and the less capable the shaitan is. And the word taqwa goes back to the word wiqaya, which is prevention. And so it prevents unhealthiness of the soul, living by taqwa. It prevents punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also prevents the shaitan from being able to influence us or to affect us. And again, this is a lifelong journey. This is something that's in and out. And the more a person is acquainted with the realities of life and the grind of life and how life is just so demanding, right? especially you know, for parents, especially for those who are trying to balance between their finances, their family, and other things that's going on. I've said this before and I'll say it again. The way American life, life in America is set up is extremely complex. And it's extremely demanding. And I hope, and this is something we desperately need. I haven't seen anything like this yet. Uh, maybe it is already started a movement like this. But there is a need for removing a lot of the layers of American life, life in America, that make it so complex and so complicated and so demanding. Right? We have a lot of benefits, trust me, a lot of conveniences. Some of the thing, some of the, one thing that brings me so much joy and pleasure uh, is just being able to drive from my home to my work without it being crazy, right? Because in Jordan, uh, the simplest, the simplest uh, errands are a hassle. Literally, it's stressful. It was stressful for me to go to the supermarket. Why? Because, well, I had to get there and there are cars everywhere and people going crazy. And then finding parking, that was stressful. Yeah, the to find parking. Hard, and the way they parked, uh, same with Pakistan. Yeah. Like, even if you get a parking, you cannot get out when you're ready. Oh, yeah. That's true. People, someone will block you, and it's extremely stressful just to park. Right? Um, and so, you know, we, we we're not negating that. However, there is so much going on that it's like thing, one thing after another thing, after another thing, after another thing, after another thing. After another thing. By the time when you actually have a break, you're thinking about what you need to do next or is there anything you're not doing? And, um, and so we really need to remove some of the unnecessary layers. That's not the case in other, and, and, cultures. In other cultures. In other cultures, in less developed countries, less developed areas, um, in rural areas, this tends to be the case where... They're more relaxed. It's more relaxed. There's not as much going on. Yeah. Right? There's not as much going on. And people can just sit there and just think. You know how important it is for us to sit there and just let our mind wander? It's like one article I read. Um, you know, it's very healthy for a person to just sit on their porch or their balcony and just stare into nothing. And just to, to just the sky. And it, very beautifully, very eloquently, the author said, you never know how imaginative and how creative you can be when you just look at nothing. Let the mind take over. Uh, Arab poets, you know, there's something called the, the, the environment of a poet. What's the environment of a poet? Night, mm -hmm. a calm night next to a campfire. Mm -hmm. 
This is the environment where poets would develop their poetry. Inspirational. It's not just inspirational, it's calm. calm. It's just quiet. It allows a person to think, to dig deep. You know, per sharing something personally. Sometimes it'd be something that is bothering me, right? Uh, something that is a responsibility I need to take over, something that is causing me an amount of emotional discomfort. It could be something very simple, right? And this thing would be bothering me, bothering me, bothering me for day after day after day. And what I've come to learn about at least myself, and I'm pretty sure this is probably the same for all human beings, is that when you actually sit down and say, okay, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to sit down and deal with this discomfort. Sit down literally takes five minutes to reconcile that, mm -hmm. to understand it, and to say, okay, this is how I'm going to deal with it. I shouldn't be bothered by it. And then it goes away. Right? Maybe you've had this experience before or try this. Something is bothering you. All you need to do is sit down and deal with it, with your mind. But we're so busy or at least so distracted by social media, by our responsibilities, by this, by that, to where we can't sit down with ourselves to deal with a basic emotional distress that literally takes five minutes to just undo and go on with your life. Um, and so I personally haven't seen any movements on social media that's encouraging or talking about a lifestyle that is less demanding. What I, I guess one thing that I've seen is uh, a one item lifestyle. You have one item of the things you need. Oh. Instead of having many uh, sets of plates yeah, and utensils yeah. and whatnot, yeah. you just have one utensil one fork, one knife, one spoon, one plate for each member of the family, and that's it, right? Now, this might be a little bit too much, especially in our cultures, and we won't be able to invite anyone. If we invite anyone, it'd be pretty embarrassing, right? But really thinking, okay, you know what? Let me look at my furniture. Something that I personally liked when I was in Jordan is the sit on the floor, sit on the floor type of uh, furniture. In fact, Muslims throughout Islamic history yeah. always preferred <laughs> ground level uh furniture right well you know is that more comfortable for the human being does that unpack one or remove one of these extra layers of life that we don't need i don't know right but just an idea to think about it a long time we could talk about that another time I think 51 or 52, but this consequence is, is somewhat longer. He talks about um, part of sustaining the soul and what we're talking about is making sure you don't listen to that which is haram mm -hmm. and making sure you don't speak that which is haram and making sure you don't look at that which is haram because um, if the senses are the channel of information that goes to our brain, then our senses are the channel of spirituality that goes to our heart as well. So what we see affects our heart. What we hear affects our heart. And so the closer a person comes to Allah, once they reach that wilaya, once they become a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does the hadith tell us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes their ears in which they hear with and their eyes in which they see and their legs in which they walk with and their arms or the hands in which they use. And the scholars have explained this is in that Allah protects their eyes, protects their ears, protects their emotions from doing things, hearing things, seeing things that um, would taint their iman. Yeah. So essentially, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such a beautiful hadith, um, hadith Qudsi. Essentially, when we put the effort to preserve Allah in our lives, Allah will preserve our iman. He'll take care of our iman. How does he take care of our Iman? By preserving and protecting our senses from seeing things that can potentially taint our Iman. Um, but before we get to that level, we need to put the effort to preserve our senses, specifically our sight and our ears, because these are the two primary senses that impact the heart. They're qu quickest to the heart. So Allah throughout the Quran tells us to listen. Listen to Allah and his messengers say. And he criticizes the disbelievers as people who don't listen. 
They're not listening. They're not using this sense. Or if they listen, they listen to things that are haram, that harm the self. Same thing with the eyes. Right? Now, interestingly enough, um, men and women, male, female, differ in terms of which of these two senses are primary. Uh, and men, for men, vision, they're more impacted by their vision. Right? They don't listen. They're not, they're not really caring about what's going on here with the ears. They're caring about this. And so in marital relationships, you know, a man likes to see his wife. That, that's more important. To see his wife is more important than to hear his wife. I don't mean that in a stereotypical way. <clears throat> right? I don't mean that in a stereotypical way. No, it's true. It's a very good point. Right? So a man enjoys seeing his wife that's what brings him more pleasure that's what strengthens and reinforces the relationship than hearing wives are opposite it's more about what they hear right and so a wife likes to hear her husband likes when her husband engages her in conversation likes when her husband praises oh you look this it's more about the the, the sound she likes to hear right I mean, that's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us but the idea is we're impacted by these two things very much. But when we're looking at haram and constantly seeing haram around us, and it's, you know, the halal around us is decreasing and the haram is increasing, you know, well, what's, what's going to happen to our hearts? And the same thing with our ears. Right? Um, It's nonsense. It's, nonsense. it's utter nonsense. Like yeah, and I hope to tackle feminism and, and this concept, inshallah, with the upcoming khutbahs. Can I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay. So Ibn Qayyim talks a lot about this. I'm not going to go over it because I think we've spoken quite a bit extensively, especially in Madaj al Salikin. We went over the sta stage of uh, uh, Sama' and, and others. So no need to uh, go over that again. The 51st consequence, is it the last one? Second to last one. وَمِنْ عُقُوبَاتِهَا أَنَّهَا تُنْسِي الْعَبْدَ نَفْسَهُ وَإِذَا نَسِيَ نَفْسَهُ أَهْمَلَهَا وَأَفْسَدَهَا وَأَهْلَكَهَا um, Among the consequences of sins is that it causes the person to forget about their own well-being. And we spoke about this before. And if a person forgets about their, their self, then they, they just uh, neglect it and they corrupt it and eventually destroy it. And I, I believe we spoke about this last time or the time before. And looking at the world around us, how people are living, they're living life as though the self really has no value. That you can do anything with the self and it's, it's okay. Just do whatever you want. Um, which is a pretty scary thing. Uh, Did you mean well-being in the spiritual sense? In all senses. Not just in the spiritual self, in all senses. Even their health and their psychological health. <laughs> And as I mentioned uh, in a khutbah, so I think two weeks ago, um, when I was advising these young ones, you know, for all those who are following feminism and liberalism and individualism and all this stuff, you have to ask the question, why is it that with the onset of these ideas and the, the, the strength, the empowerment of these ideas, and people actually living by the values and the principles of these ideas, you're finding a massive problem when it comes to mental health and identity right if feminism is meant to empower women make their lives better why is it that women are far more likely to fall into severe depression far more likely to be victims of domestic violence one in four women are victims of severe domestic violence in the west or in america specifically one in four 25 percent of women 25%, can you imagine that? Are victims of domestic violence, severe domestic violence, while one in three are victims of some form of domestic violence. One in three, 33%, can you imagine that? Uh, women are two to three times as likely to develop depression than men. Well, feminism is meant to empower women, to strengthen women. It's not happening. I'm not saying feminism is causing these things. But it's, it's clearly not resolving them. It seems like things are becoming maybe worse than it was before. Right? Um, 
And so we have to ask the question, is this really helping us? If individualism and liberalism is meant to free the individual, empower the individual, and make them live a more fulfilling life, and you look at mental health and depression rates and suicide rates, it's clearly not helping. I'm not, again, I'm not saying it's causing these things, even though I think an argument can be made that it is causing these things, but I'm not going to make the argument right now. It's at least not resolving them. And so we, we should do ourselves a big favor and begin to reanalyze these things. And of course, us as Muslims, we know that the, the healthiest way to live, the happiest way to live is through Islam. Submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the most balanced lifestyle. So essentially sins, one of the effects of sins is that it distracts the individual from caring about their, their self. You know, when you look at people who talk about how to live a healthy lifestyle all around, I'm talking about Muslims now, uh, because I, for me personally, uh, Western influencers and the way they view life and the, their lifestyles is simply not interesting to me, this period. It, it's not rounded, it's not well-rounded, it's not well-balanced. It, it only focuses on one aspect of life, either the psychological or the physical, that's it. And they completely ignore the spiritual as though it's not there. But for us Muslims, it's all three. We need a balance between all three. And so one individual says, if you want to live a healthy lifestyle, then they recommend the following. Salah, number one. Salah helps, live a happy life, helps us live a happy lifestyle. Number two, reading 50. And this, is, this isn't in any particular order. This isn't in any particular order. I'm just naming them as I remember. Reading 15 minutes a day. Number three, exercising 15 minutes a day. Number four, al-iman billah, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a fifth one, I forgot it. But notice, we pray, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these two other things, reading 15 minutes a day, exercising 15 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day is nothing. It's easily doable. Yeah, how many people do it? Very few. I don't do it. Right? I read for, alhamdulillah, 15 minutes a day. I think that's... But exercise, it's so hard for me to get myself into this habit of exercising just 15 minutes a day. That's it. Right? Well, to use this as a kind of analogy, when a person sins, essentially, it becomes... They're distracted from doing the things that are healthy for the self. Okay. Um, now, I'm not saying that we're not exercising because we're sinning and it's distracting us. No, but I'm trying to just give an analogy. How, see how difficult it is for us to implement such a simple uh, daily routine? Well, those who do sins, it becomes extremely difficult for them to implement uh, routines that are healthy for the self, that are, uh, or they're distracted from it. And one of the things I like doing is after Ramadan, I love hearing the experiences of new Muslims where it's their first time fasting Ramadan. And it's, in, it's insane for them. It's like it's a life-changing thing for them. It's an it's intense workout that the soul has never done before. But it has such, pow such a powerful and, and important impact on their soul that it's like, whoa, this is serious. This is serious. Okay. So... Um, one of the consequences of sins is that it causes us to forget our well-being and live a lifestyle that caters to our well-being well or at least it works towards uh, our well-being and then the final consequence of sin is وَمِنْ عُقُوبَاتِهَا أَنَّهَا تُزِيلُ النِّعَمْ الْحَاضِرَةَ وَقَطْعُ النِّعَمْ الْوَاصِلَةَ فتزيل الحاصل وتقطع الواصل فإن نعم الله ما حفظ موجودها بمثل طاعته ولا استجلب مفقودها بمثل طاعته فإن ما عنده لا ينال إلا بطاعته سبحانه وقد جعل الله سبحانه لكل شيء سببا وآفة سببا يجلبه وآفة تبطله انتظيا so here ابن القيم رحمة الله عليه says that sins remove blessings in our lives now blessings 
there are two ways, there are two types of blessings. I'm not talking about the what, I'm talking about how it's a blessing. The first type is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bringing something new to us or something you know that wasn't there before. This is a type of blessing. You get a raise in your job. That's a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings to you, brings forth. It's a new blessing. Uh, the other type of blessing is the continuity of the blessings you already have. So getting a raise in a job is a blessing. And the continuity of your job is a blessing as well. So even if you don't get a raise, the continuity of, that, of, of your job, where you're consistently getting a paycheck, is a blessing. You might not be buying a home. You, you bought a home, right? You have something new that's been given to you, a new blessing. Now, normally, we live in the same home for 30 years, right? It's, it's a pretty big investment. And we live our entire lives until our children get older, and maybe after that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something else for us. But that continuity of your home is a blessing. When you look at trees, those trees that we see around us were, once weren't there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them. That's a blessing. And then these trees live for decades upon decades. Sometimes some trees live for hundreds of years. That continuity of that existence of the tree is a blessing. Okay. So what sins do is harms, cuts one of these two. It either prevents a blessing from coming to you or it cuts and stops the continuity of a blessing that you were enjoying before. Um, and nobody wants that. Yeah, so that, of course, that's a blessing. But I'm just kind of giving you an angle in which we can look at uh, blessings. So sins either prevent blessings from reaching us or they stop the continuity or discontinue a blessing that we were enjoying uh, before. So that's one of the consequences of sins. But there's actually one more consequence of sins. There's 53. Or there's 54. Is there? Yeah, there's 54. Okay, two more. All right. ومن عقوباتها أنها تباعد عن العبد وليه وأنفع الخلق له وأنصحهم له ومن سعادته في قربه من uh, This consequence is that um, it distances our, our or those who are sent by Allah to protect us, meaning the angels. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the consequences of sins is that it causes the angels to become distant from us. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean physical distance. It doesn't necessarily mean physical distance. But distance, their, the benefit of their presence in our lives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He sends these angels to protect us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels to protect us. And then there are angels who do istighfar and make dua, but specifically for the believers. Allah, the angels make dua for the repenters, those who are believers. So the more sins a person does, the less they benefit from these angels. The presence that they were, or the, the reason they were created, or at least sent to us. Um, and any one of us can appreciate why we need angels to be close to us. Nobody wants an evil, wicked person to enter their home, period. No one wants someone like that. I mean, I'm sure we all know someone where no way this person is entering my home, period. They're just a wicked person, a problem causer. Right? Similarly, we want people to enter our homes who are good, who are nice, who are gracious. And you know, something I love about the Desi community that you don't really find in the Arab community is that they really love people who they view as righteous people come to our home bring blessings to our home bring barakah to our home um you know you're familiar with this right in this community they love inviting pious people because they feel like they bring the type of barakah and i mean they hold them mm -hmm. in very high esteem in very high esteem right the arabs are a little bit more feisty you kind of have to earn their respect before <laughs> before they respect you um but the idea is that uh, there is this culture with Muslims that if there's a righteous person 
we love to invite them because we feel like Allah will reward us for being kind to uh, those who, who we think Allah loves, right? Uh, and so Allah loves the angels, He created the angels in righteousness and with righteousness and they're only capable of righteousness. And so there's a type of barakah or barakat that come with the presence of angels. Uh, and so that's who we want to be in our homes, that's who we want to be close to us. Uh, but a sinner distances them from, from the self and from the home. Just like the one who has a dog in their home, the angels don't enter that home. Um, You'd be surprised how many basic people have dogs in their homes. Yeah. They yeah. Don't well, the culture. They're like, uh, even the even culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've noticed in the, the Arab world when I was in Jordan, my last few years, I noticed a surprising increase in the amount of uh, people who were taking dogs as pets. Um, what about cats? Cats are fine. Nothing wrong with cats. Yeah. Cats are fine. So the Prophet or there's an ather, a narration that says, إِذَا كَذَبَ الْعَبْدُ تَبَاعَدَ مِنْهُ الْمَلَكُ مِيلًا مِنْ نَتِنِ رِيحِهِ In this narration, it said that when a person lies, the angels distance themselves a mile. Now, a mil in the Arabic language or the classical use of the word is more than what we know today as a mile. I forgot the exact distance, but it's a few miles actually. But the idea here is that when a, someone lies, the angels distance themselves from that person uh, due to the stench of what they said. Mm -hmm. So when they say a lie, it's, it has stench. At least the angels uh, smell it, according to this narration. And in another hadith, um, the Prophet ﷺ tells us not to go to the masjid after eating a lot of onions and a lot of and or garlic. Why? Because the angels are bothered by what bothers us. So you have this kind of uh, um, similarity here. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوَعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ In this verse, uh, or these two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who said our Lord is Allah, Allah is our Lord, and then they lived by that. Uh, when they die, the angels come down. The angels descend to them and tell them, do not be afraid, do not grieve, uh, and we give you glad tidings of paradise which you were promised. We were your guardians in this life and we're going to be your guardians in the afterlife. What verse is this? This is in Surah Fusilat, uh, chapter 41, verses 30 and 31. Okay. So essentially, uh, the angels, as we've spoken before, the angels, if the shayateen are whispering evil in our minds and in our ears, the angels are whispering good in our minds and our ears. And so Allah sent them to be guardians, to be protectors of humans by encouraging them to do good, stopping uh, harm from coming to them. They were doing that in this life. In the afterlife, uh, they also carry on this role, this task of protecting us or guarding us. And at least we can say in the afterlife, when the soul leaves, they guide the soul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They help the soul reach their abode and their pleasure. Uh, so the idea here is, Angels are our guardians, but how much we enjoy from that guardianship uh, is pretty uh, dependent on our good deeds or our bad deeds. The more good deeds, the closer they are to us. The more bad deeds, the more distant they become from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then um, help her find solace. Yes. Uh, All right. And then the last consequence, number fifty-four, تستجلب مواد هلاك العبد في دنياه وآخرته فإن الذنوب هي أمراض متى استحكمت قتلت ولا بد. So this goes back to something that was uh, we were, were discussing earlier, and that is um, our actions, like they uh, affect the body physically, mentally, they also affect our soul as well, our spirituality. 
and sins uh, are tainted sustenance, sustenance that is poison, that is tainted, and like bad food will cause weakness in the body, like viruses will make a person sick, sins are bad food, tainted food, spoiled food, as well as viruses that are introduced to our heart, to our souls, I mean, uh, as a result of our actions. And if that, uh, if that illness becomes strong enough, it will fully root in our body and we, we are now, a person is now affected with a, what we call a terminal illness. Of course, uh, no one is, um, anyone can be saved through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, just like someone who has a terminal illness can technically uh, find cure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah can cure them. There are stories of someone who had stage four cancer and they went to Umrah and they drank Zamzam and they came back and there's nothing, subhanAllah. Um, but the idea is that like our body can get sick, our soul can get sick. And our soul gets sick through sins, as a result of sins. And there's nothing that keeps our soul healthy like uh, submission to Allah's commands and staying away from his um, uh, prohibitions and tawbah. Doing tawbah is like throwing up that the tainted stuff in our body. So when we eat something that's spoiled, when we get food poisoning, our body throws that food up. Why? Vomits that food. Why? Because it's getting rid of it. So it doesn't harm the body. Tawbah uh, does to sins what vomit does to bad food. It gets it out of our system. And of course, doing good deeds like fasting helps vomit out that those uh, impurities, those things that are tainting our soul. Allah Ta'ala Alam. With that, we conclude the consequences of sins and we ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to protect us and to grant us the insight and the uh, tawfiq to be people of ta'a, to be people of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because nothing allows us to acquire blessings in life uh, more effectively than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing affects our lives negatively more than uh, sins and so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq we'll go ahead and stop here for today wa sallallahu ala nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in